descended from a wild wolf. What's his name? Sequin. This is Sequin, who's a German shepherd, and I think we could say that Sequin is the one who most resembles the ancestral wolf. And this is Archie. Archie, that's a fine name. Archie, a Great Dane, and here's what you get from breeding for larger and larger size. But they're all descended from a wolf. They're all cousins of one another. And Sequin is showing great interest. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Charles Darwin was very interested in dogs. He was also very interested in pigeons. Thank you. Hello. Hello. You're on my notes, pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Marchinero cropper. It's a pigeon which has been bred by artificial selection from the wild rock dove, and in this case it's been bred for thickness of feathers and for size of crop. You see the great big crop at the front, which is blowing up like that, and see how big the feathers are. <laughs> now in the cage here, uh, we didn't quite trust these ones to be, to be let out. We trust this one. Uh, this is a domestic flight pigeon, and you see how it's been bred for this curious little ruff round the back of the neck, and also the red ring round the eye. The other one is an English short-faced tumbler pigeon. You see the extraordinary short face and the tiny, small beak. And that, again, is a product of artificial selection, just like in the case of the dogs and the cabbages. The beak is so short, in the case of the English short-faced tumbler, that this breed is no longer capable of feeding its own young. And so the only way that breed can be reared is by its babies being reared by pigeons of another breed. The same, that sort of thing often happens, by the way, with artificial selection. Uh, it's true of bulldogs. Um, if you... You probably know that uh, the, the bulldog breed of dog has a head that's so big that it can't be born. And the only way a bulldog can be born is by caesarean section. And so the entire breed depends upon humanity to keep it going. If we went extinct, the bulldog would go extinct. Now, artificial selection, the process that produces these dogs and these pigeons and these cabbages, is too slow for us to see during the course of one lecture. But we can imitate it on a computer, and I'm going to do it with a program called Arthromorphs. These are arthromorphs. This is the parent arthromorph, and round the, the edge of it are eight child arthromorphs. And they resemble the parent very closely, but there may be a, a genetic change, a mutation, a random genetic change as you go from parent to child. So that one, for example, has longer legs. That one's got its legs up instead of down. And the way you breed arthromorphs... Could I have a volunteer to... My goodness. Um, right, yes. Thank you. Um, have you ever used a computer with a mouse? Yes. Yes, OK. What you do, then, is you choose the one you want to breed from uh, and just click it once. So he's going for the long-legged one, I think. Click it. It goes to the centre and becomes the parent of the next generation. Now you see all the next generation have longer legs. What's your name, by the way? Lawrence. Lawrence. Lawrence, it seems to be breeding for longer legs. I wonder he, if he's going to continue that. That's right. Keep going. Don't wait for me. Just, just keep on breeding. OK. Lawrence likes long legs. <laughs> and they're getting longer. And OK. Now, what I said was that uh, these creatures have genes which are going from parent to child. What would I mean by talking about genes in a computer? Well, in a computer, of course, genes would just be numbers. Uh, they're not real genes, they're not made of DNA, but nevertheless, they are genes in the sense that they are what go through from generation to generation. <laughs> There's no sex in these creatures, by the way. These are all 
reproducing asexually, like stick insects and uh, like, like aphids. Carry on. <laughs> read, as, read as fast as you can to get through a lot of generations. So what we're seeing now, what Lawrence is doing, is artificial selection, just like our ancestors did with dogs and pigeons. But he's managing to achieve, in a couple of minutes, what would have taken several centuries for our ancestors to have achieved. <coughs> What are you going for, Lawrence? What? Legs. You're, you're trying to get lots of zigzags in the legs, are you? All right, perhaps we'd better proceed now. So, thank you very much indeed, Lawrence. <laughs> well, I hope, I think we're all convinced by now that artificial selection works. We've seen the result of it in dogs, cabbages and pigeons, and we've seen it happening before our eyes in the computer arthromorphs. But that's just artificial selection. We only began talking about artificial selection because we're really interested in natural selection. Natural selection is like artificial selection, except that instead of humans doing the choosing, nature does the choosing. Of all the puppies in a litter, or wolf cubs in a litter, instead of our choosing which ones shall breed, what happens is that nature chooses which ones shall breed. The ones that have what it takes to survive will be the ones that breed, automatically chosen. The ones that are good at running fast, the ones whose legs are not too short and not too long, the ones whose teeth are not too blunt and not too sharp, because if they're too sharp, they might break easily. Natural selection, nature, is constantly choosing which individuals shall live, which individuals shall breed. And the result, after many generations of natural selection, is much the same as the result after many generations of artificial selection. So what would it take to change the arthromorph program so that it simulated natural selection instead of artificial selection? Because at present, the arthromorphs are just being chosen by the eyes of a human. Could we somehow make the computer do its own choosing, choosing on the basis of quality, of arthromorphs. Well, the trouble is it's not easy to judge what quality in an arthromorph might mean, because these arthromorphs are living in a very strange environment, the two-dimensional computer screen. They don't have a real world in which to live. They don't have predators. They don't have prey. They don't have food that they've got to catch. Perhaps we could do better if we made a computer model of a two-dimensional designoid object, like a spider web. Now, if we could have the lights down, I think we might be able to see... Now, there is a spider in the middle of its web, and that, I think, shows quite nicely. Good. Right, well, you know what a spider web is for. It's for catching flies and other prey. It's a net, and the, it works in two dimensions. It's, we would have liked to have actually shown you a, a spider building its web, but this one seems to be... Uh, pretty satisfied with the web it's already got. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do instead is to show you a computer reconstruction of a spider's movements while it builds a web. Now, I have to watch carefully. This is rather speeded up. Can we have that more slowly now, Peter? What the spider's now doing is the radii of the web. Now it's doing the structural spiral, which is a kind of, of uh, scaffolding. And now it's doing the sticky spiral, which is the bit that actually does the business of catching the uh, flies. Let's have it once more slowly. Right. Right, there are the radii. Now it's, now it's doing the scaffolding, and now it's doing the real sticky spiral. What we're seeing there is not actually a picture of the web itself. That's a picture of the movement.